Hi everybody, it's Mr. Pope from Winter Grammar School for Boys and this is the 8th probability and statistics section we're going to be looking at and it's going to be on the Poisson distribution. Um, so, the Poisson distribution, what is it? Well, it's first of all, it's a discrete distribution. Okay, so that means the results are usually coming in quantized packets. Okay, so for example, I could say the probability my distribution is a particular value like 5 is an okay thing to do but to say something like the probability that x equals to I don't know um, root 2 pi that's not a particularly good thing um, to do necessarily um, usually in the context of the question we're going to be having um, our probability density function looking like this where there's groups for particular values of x and I don't know, let's say this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 then, you know, and then the, the sum of all these variables um, the sum of all the areas of all these boxes equals to 1 there is a slight difference however the Poisson distribution is a little bit different because technically there is no end to this, it just goes on forever. Okay, so there is still a finite possibility of saying like a number of a hundred or maybe of a number of a million um, out there at the far edge. There might be an infinitesimally tiny box, but that still would contribute to some area. So, okay, let's just crack on with it. So, like all distributions, we've got to write down how it's distributed and the way a distribution would be distributed Poisson is imagine a variable and it's distributed and then we'd say PO like so for Poisson and then the only characteristic of this is what we call lambda and this lambda is like the rate of occurrence in a given time interval. Okay, and we haven't covered um, probability generating functions just yet, uh, but we will do not next week, but the week after, week commencing 22nd of uh, July, no, June, sorry. Um, it's not, so we'll be doing it in probability and statistics. Um, oh, 11 actually, you've got the negative binomial, then chi-squared, then PGFs. Um, but for now, an important thing to note with the Poisson distribution is that the variance is the same as the mean, is the same as this lambda. Okay, so whenever you're interested in um, the, the variance or the mean of a Poisson distribution, it's just lambda. So, and this lambda is also the rate. So, say for example, um, we've got, say, a supermarket. Can't spell supermarket, that's great. Supermarket um, usually has um, one robbery in, let's say, 10 months on average then you could say that we've got a rate i.e. one robbery per a 10 month period so you could say for a 10 month period this could have a Poisson distribution of rate 1 if you wanted it say over 20 months then it could be a Poisson of rate 2 if you wanted it over a smaller interval for example one month then all you do is just scale it down, so it's a Poisson of say 0.1, just divide it by 10. Okay, so that's what I mean by a rate. Okay, now you're probably thinking, okay, but what is it? You haven't actually explained it yet. Okay, so before I do that, I super promise, I want to list out um, a couple of things. Okay, for a Poisson 
distribution to be valid, the following has to be um, true. So events, i.e. or occurrences in the model, must happen what's called singly. Um, I prefer the term singularly, but what do I mean singularly? Well, let's take the supermarket example. We're going to assume that if the supermarket is being robbed by one person or one group of people, that there's not another group of people robbing them at the same time, i.e. you can't have more than one robbery going on at the same time. It's just being robbed that day. So we so so in in one interval or period an event happens once no matter how small the interval okay so events occur singly that's one thing Second of all, they have to be independent. Okay, what do I mean by that? I mean that the, the occurrences do not affect each other. So what do I mean by that? Well, I mean in the supermarket example, if word got out that the supermarket was robbed yesterday, that's not going to, inc that's not going to affect the chances of it being robbed, say tomorrow or next week, you know, it's it's, it's random. The, the the whole thing probabilistically resets itself. So as long as occurrences happen independently and they're not affecting each other, poisson for French for fish. Okay. Um next up we also need the the Well, essentially what I've said over here, we need that lambda is proportional to the interval length. Okay, so notice how when lambda's 1 when the interval's 10, lambda's 2 when the interval's 20, and lambda is 0 0.1 when the interval is 1. It has to be scaled up. Lambda entirely depends on the interval that you're actually talking about. Proportional. Okay, so now I'm going to run a little thought experiment and imagine that we've got a, a length of time. Okay, let's say the timer stops here and from over here this is one length of time. So I don't know, that could be one year, it could be one day, and so on and so on. And let's suppose that these orange dots are going to represent when an event occurs due to a Poisson distribution. So let's say, I don't know, we start the timer from zero, and then a dot happens, a little bit longer, then a dot happens, then another dot happens, and then carry on, and then a dot happens, and then carry on, and then a dot happens. Okay. So let's say in this example, when we did this process, there appears to be five occurrences um, and you they each of these have got like a timestamp. Like this is this is happen this one here um, over here is happening at T1, this happens at T2, this is at T3, this happens at T4, and this is at T5. But clearly, as we're going from left to right, the time is increasing and these things just happen to happen. Okay, right, what we're going to do is we're going to split up, right, this time interval into n equal sections. So let's say one there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. So I'm just splitting it up like this. It's arbitrary. We're going to be talking about this in a second. So let's say we split the interval into n equally spaced 
um, sub intervals and they are each of width now because it's a unit time the whole thing it's 1 over n do you agree if the whole thing is 1 then the gap between here and here is 1 over n now what's the probability what's the probability of finding an orange dot in our interval well we we're saying because this is a poisson and we want this to be a rate then the rate is just lambda so it's just going to be lambda times by the width of the interval so it's just going to be lambda over n Okay. Um, hopefully that should make sense. I mean, put it this way: if n was one, okay, then it would just be lambda over one. That's, that's not particularly useful, is it? Um, but the larger and larger we make lambda, the smaller this number gets, because essentially we're breaking this down into finer and finer intervals and it's less likely we're going to get one of those dots in those intervals. Clearly, if one thing happened in a particular interval, then it's going to, the probability is going to be greater than one because we've already, we know we've 100% got it. So the probability of finding um, a dot in our interval is going to be lambda over n. Now, consider we use our knowledge of another discrete distribution that we've seen so far and that is the binomial. Now technically the binomial belongs to a set of uh, distributions called the Bernoulli trials and it's possible to approximate things using Bernoulli trials as long as there is a chance of success or failure, the trials are independent and um, yeah there's other things but th those are the two main things if, if there's success or failure or the trials are independent are really what we're going for here. So if I was to look at this as a binomial for example then what would happen? Well, for a binomial, it's usually n choose x. If I want the probability that my distribution equals some x, then it's n choose x of p to the x times by 1 minus p, the failure, to the n minus x. Okay. Generally speaking, that's how we work out the probability of a binomial. I think I covered this in a previous video, so if this is a little bit like new, then you need to go back and refresh yourself. So consider, consider this. Well, what is the probability of success in our trial? Well, it's lambda over n, as we've discussed. So 1 minus p is just going to be 1 minus lambda over n. So what is for our Poisson, what is it going to be? Well, it's going to be the probability that x is x is going to be n choose x times by p, which is lambda over n to the power of x times by 1 minus lambda over n to the power of n minus x. And technically, as I said before, for the Poisson, the amount of trials goes to infinity. So really, for it to be the case of a Poisson, we want the limiting case when n tends to infinity. Because we want to, we, although the distribution is discrete itself, 
the intervals that we divide it up into need to be infinitesimally small because time is a continuum. Time doesn't just come in discrete packets, time is a continuum. So we have to take the limiting case when we split that time interval up over here into infinitely tiny gaps of 1 over n. So, that being said, we need to tidy all this stuff up. So, this is the limiting case in terms when n tends to infinity of. Now, n choose x, that is just going to be n factorial over x factorial times n minus x factorial. And lambda over n to the power x is just lambda to the x over n to the x. And then 1 minus lambda over n is just going to be 1 minus lambda over n to the power n, these are all times by, by the way, times by 1 minus lambda over n to the minus x, okay? Because when I multiply these two things together, I add the exponents, it's just the indices rule. That shouldn't be a problem. Okay, now if I manipulate this a little bit, then the limit as n tends to infinity, n factorial is n times by n minus 1, times by n minus 2, and so on and so on. And then I'm going to reach a point where I've got n minus x plus 1, and then it's going to be n minus x, and then it's going to be multiplied by n minus x minus 1, and so on and so on, times 2 times 1 on the top. And this is all being divided by x factorial times by n minus x factorial. And I'm hoping you can see that this n minus x factorial here is going to cross out with up to this term, i.e. the n factorial is just going to stop at n minus x plus 1 factorial because it's one term in front of the n minus x term. And the rest is still as follows. So that's still going to be lambda x over n to the x. This is still going to be times by 1 minus lambda over n to the n. This is still going to be 1 minus lambda over n to the minus x. Okay. Now, if I redistribute this a little bit, I'm going to have n times by n minus 1 times by n minus 2 and so on and so on and so on times by n minus x plus 1 on the top. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap the x factorial and the n to the x over. So this becomes n to the x over here times by lambda to the x over x factorial. And this is still the limiting case as n tends to infinity. Now the reason I can do that is because if I've got 2 thirds times by 3 quarters, that's the same as 2 quarters times by 3 over 3. That's just how multiplication of fractions work. It's absolutely fine. Don't panic about it. That should be totally fine. This is just real numbers. And then the rest is still as follows. That's so still going to be 1 minus lambda over n to the power of n. And this is times by 1 minus lambda over n to the minus x, like so. Um, and now, if we think about this a lot, we're going to have an n term here. This is the first n. And then n minus 1, this is the second term. n minus 2, this is the third term. So question, how many terms are going to be there on the top? Well, think about it. I just look at this end number, take the negative of it, and then add 1, right? Minus 1, take the negative of it, and then add 1, will just give the second term. So minus x plus 1, take the negative of it, and then add 1, that just means I'm going to have x terms. So we've actually got x terms on the bottom. Why is that useful? because I've got n to the x on the bottom. So this n to the x can be split up as this over n times by this over n times this over n and so on, this over n. And now there's a couple of things that simplify here. 
because I've now got the limit as n tends to infinity of n over n times by n minus 1 over n times by n minus 2 over n times by and so on and so on and then the last term will be n minus x plus 1 over n and now look what happens n over n is 1 n minus 1 over n cancels down to 1 minus 1 over n. n minus 2 over n becomes 1 minus 2 over n. And then the last term is going to be 1 minus x plus 1 over n. And now let's deal with this a little more. These are all multiplied together. This is times by lambda x over x. Uh, Right, let's deal with this. Well, I've just got a 1 here. When 1 over n, as n tends to infinity, this is just going to tend to 0, right? Because 1 divided by a ridiculously large number gets smaller and smaller. So this term becomes a 1, because it's 1 minus 0. This term tends to a 1, because it's 1 minus 0. And then for any x, if n tends to infinity, this term is going to tend to 1 as well. So this whole first thing... It's just going to be 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 x times. So it's 1 to the power x, which is just 1. Okay. Next term. I've got 1 minus lambda over n to the power of n. What does this thing become when n goes to infinity? And for the smarter ones out there, especially went through the central limit theorem um, and various other videos, I said that e to the x is the limit um, as n tends to infinity of 1 plus x over n to the power n. So what do you think that's going to become? Well, x x has clearly been replaced with minus lambda here. So this whole thing is just going to become e to the minus lambda. And then finally, we've got one last term. That's this thing down here. And that's 1 minus lambda over n to the power of minus x. And then this is really easy because lambda over n just tends to a 0. So this is 1 minus 0, which is just a 1. And 1 to any power, including minus x, so long as x itself, well, no, it's going to be fine. So this whole thing just cancels out to be a 1. So now, lo and behold, we're left with the probability for a Poisson distribution that our distribution equals some value x is just going to be lambda to the power of x times by e to the minus lambda all over x factorial. Okay. Now, this is very important. This is our probability uh, density function. And there's various things you can do here. One, to prove that the mean is the same as the variance, and that mean and variance is indeed lambda, I need to talk about prob... There's two things. One, I need to talk about probability generating functions. And two, I would need to introduce a whole load of other functions you haven't seen before. Um, I think I'd have to introduce the di gamma function or the gamma function for sure, because to be... The PGFs, the probability generating functions, essentially mean you, you have to differentiate. Now, lambda to the x, you should be able to differentiate with respect to x. e to the minus lambda is just a constant, so that's easy to differentiate. But x factorial, that's quite a difficult thing to differentiate uh, and intrinsically linked with the gamma function. Uh, because the gamma function can be expressed as an integral, and I really don't want to get into that in this video. I just want to stick to the Poisson distribution. Um, but needless to say, you differentiate this thing, um, you'd substitute in uh, x is 1, and then that would equal your mean. You'd differentiate it again, and that would be your mean of x squared, and 
these different generating functions you'd get. I'll talk about it at the time. The point is for the Poisson distribution to find the probability your distribution has a particular value, it's this, and the mean is the same as the variance. These are the two takeaways of this, and this is in the further maths course if you decide to study S1, further stats 1. Really important. Um, yeah, so hopefully I've given a sufficient demonstration of where it comes from, the motivation for it. Um, by the way, this kind of graph, for, for particular values of lambda, it does seem to have a positive skew. The bars do anyway. So for, if I was to draw the distribution, um, I don't know, if I was to draw, say, x is distributed Poisson by 20, then I, I would expect to see um, lots and lots of bars uh, builds at the beginning, and then there's definitely a positive skew, i.e. it just dies off infinitesimally going this way, and so on and so on. If I was to draw a midpoint of each of the bars, it would spike up fairly quickly and then die off fairly slowly. And the reason for that is because you've got this um, negative exponential thing going on here. Um, and if you know what an exponential graph looks like, you'll, you'll recognize the tail. Um, so, a couple of other key facts as well. For example, suppose, um, suppose I've got x, so a couple of, e so example, Suppose I've got x, which is a Poisson distribution of, say, lambda, and I've got y, which is also a Poisson distribution, but let's say it's of mu. Well, let's not pick mu. Let's pick uh, theta. Then if z is when I add those two distributions together, then z will just be a Poisson distribution of when you add the two rates together. Okay, think about what that is. For a Poisson distribution, they must be independent. So by definition, x and y must be independent random variables. If I add two independent random variables together, I should be able to add their rates together, and that shouldn't be a problem. Okay, so this, this is also another little key takeaway. Uh, it's a little tickle into joint distributions, although not really. And it's what happens when you add distributions together to form a new one in terms of a Poisson. Okay, there's two other things I wanted to talk about. Now, if you want to approximate a binomial with a Poisson, okay, there's two main things here. One, n has to be really large and two p has to be really small well hopefully you can see why n has to be large because the poisson thing goes on forever i.e there's a in, there's a finite probability of having any particular value so if your binomial just stopped after three for example that's a bit dumb and two the Poisson has a positive skew, i.e. it's got a tail in the positive direction. And that only really happens when, for the binomial case, when the p-value is really small. Remember about the symmetry and the types of skew with the binomial distribution. So, if you've got a question... So, okay, put it this way. If you've got a question that you think, hmm, there's a probability of success or failure, but it just so happens to be that n is really large, and I know that's vague, but I don't know, let's say n is greater than 30. It doesn't matter. Put it this way, the larger the n value is, the better it is as a distribution. And p is small, I don't know, let's say p is less than 0.1. It doesn't matter. If p is 0.11, that's still fine. Just obviously as small a p as you can go. Okay. And the final thing is when it comes to hypothesis testing... And when it comes to hypothesis testing, y 
you know, you do the same thing. Right? It's no different. Okay? It's just another distribution that you can test for. I.e., if you've got a one-tailed test and it's at 5%, then you want either the bottom 5% down there or you want the top 5% up here and so on and so on. It's honestly not that big of a deal. However, there's a couple of things. One, um, how to actually do the calculations on a calculator. So say, for example, I want probability that x is greater than or equal to 6. That is the same as the probability, is, uh, sorry, of, of 1 minus the probability x is less than or equal to 5. Remember, it's discrete. And on your calculator, if you go to the statistics mode, which is usually number 7 uh, for the FX991EX, or mode 2 for the CG50, then the Poisson PD, probability distribution, is for problems when you've got P of X equals little x, and the Poisson CD is for when you're dealing with X is less than or equal to little x. Okay, so it's the same deal. Remember, you just have to be really careful with your boundaries, and I will go through the calculations when I'm going through stuff, but a lot of the time I'll just be typing things into my calculator and I'll be talking to you what it is I'm actually typing on my calculator. So yeah, that's pretty much the Poisson distribution in a nutshell. Um, it's a really famous distribution, it's used in lots of problems. Um, it's the building block for, for a lot of other distributions, uh, especially joint distributions. Pretty much anything to do with the rate, whether it's decay, growth, that kind of thing, there's probably a Poisson distribution lurking in there, guarantee. Okay, so I'm just going to go through a couple of examples then. If you want to try them, give it a go yourself. Pause the video, but I'm going to go through it now. Okay, Indre works on reception in an office and deals with all the telephone calls that arrive. Calls arrive randomly, and in a four-hour morning shift, there are on average 80 calls. So we've already got a rate. We've got 80 calls per four hours. Using a suitable model, find the probability of more than four calls arriving in a 20-minute period one morning. Okay, so the question is, if it's 80 per four hours, what's the rate going to be per 20 minutes? Well, 20 minutes is a third of an hour. So if I do 4 divided by 4 to get 1 hour, and then divided by 3 to get 20 minutes, that must mean I've divided by 12. So that means the rate must be 80 over 12, and 80 over 12 is 20 over 3. So that means we have a Poisson distribution of 20 over 3 in a 20 minute period. And now I want the probability of more than four calls. So I want the probability of x being greater than four. Now clearly, that is going to be one minus the probability x is less than or equal to four. Because remember, if I want all the blocks, because it's discrete, this is essentially saying five, six, seven, eight, and so on. But I want the probability of one minus all the zeros, one, two, three, and four calls probabilities. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my statistics function. I'm going to go to F5 for distribution, then go to the right F6 of my CG50, and then F1 is Poisson, and then I want the Poisson cumulative, cumulative distribution, PCD. I want my lower bound to be 0, I want my upper bound to be um, 4, and my lambda value to be 20 over 3. And you should get the, the calculation we want is 1 minus 0 0.20562724 and stuff. So the answer to this question is just going to be 1 minus 0 0.20562724 and stuff. So I'm looking at 0 0.79437 and stuff. 
so I'll just arbitrarily stop it at three decimal places, so 0 0.794 to three decimal places. So looking, the probability of receiving more than four calls in a 20 minute period is looking about 79.4%. Okay, if you're curious as to how you would do this without a calculator, then the actual calculations would be that as follows. You would do 1 minus, and now the probability of 0 would be, well, it's 20 over 3, that's lambda, to the power of x, which is 0, times by e to the minus lambda, which is minus 20 over 3, all over x factorial, which is 0, plus and then the probability for 1. So it would be 20 over 3 to the 1 times by e to the minus 20 over 3 all over 1 factorial. By the way, 0 factorial is 1. Plus, and then we'd have 20 over 3 squared, and this would be e to the minus 20 over 3, and this would all be over 2 factorial. Plus, and then we've got 20 over 3 cubed times by e to the minus 20 over 3 all over 3 factorial, plus 20 over 3 to the 4, e to the minus 20 over 3, all over 4 factorial. So you could plug that into your calculator, but to be honest, saving time, get a calculator, get a calculator with an inbuilt distribution function. Please, it will save you a lot of time. This is essentially what your calculator is doing. I mean, you can write it out like that and just type that all in, I mean, there's, there's various other tricks you could have done to this. You could have noticed that they've all got e to the minus 20 over 3 is a common factor. So you could have actually done 1 minus e to the minus 20 over 3, lots of. And then the first term is 20 over 3 to the 0, which is 1 over 1, so that's 1, plus 20 over 3 to the 1 over 1, which is 20 over 3, plus, and then 20 over 3 squared over 2, so that's going to be a half of 20 over 3 squared, plus, and then over 3 factorial is 1 sixth of 20 over 3 cubed, plus, and then 1 over 4 factorial is 1 over 24, uh, 20 over 3, sorry, to the power of 4. Whatever. The point is, just don't waste your time, personally. Okay, Indre is allowed 20 minutes of break time during each 4-hour morning shift, which she can take in 5-minute periods. When she takes a break, a machine records details of any call in the office that Indre has missed. One morning, Indre took her break time in four periods of five minutes each. Find the probability that in exactly each of these periods there was no call. Right. Okay. Now let's get the rate for these five-minute periods. So, if lambda was 20 over 3 for 20 minutes... Then think about it, lambda must be 5 over 3 for a 5 minute interval, right? I'm just scaling it down. I divide this by 4, I divide this by 4. So let's call our new distribution z, distributed Poisson-like, with a rate of 5 thirds. And now I want, to, I want to know what's the probability of z equaling to 0 because the probability in a five minute interval, there's no calls. So I go to my calculator, menu, statistics, uh, distribution, go to the right, Poisson, PD function this time, because I want a value at a specific point. I want my X to be zero and my lambda value to be five thirds. And I get a PD, a probability of 0 0.1888756, but I'll just take that as 0.19. Now, I have the probability that in one five-minute um, zone interval, there's no calls. I want to find the probability that three of the four periods there was no calls. So now consider y, which is a binomial distribution with four periods of a call, and the probability of success is now that 0.19. And I want to work out the probability that y is 3. Do you see how there's a distribution within a distribution? 
You know, that Poisson distribution fed into a larger picture of a binomial. Don't be scared that sometimes, you know, a problem may seem complex. It's just distributions within distributions. It's honestly not that bad. And to be honest, it just takes practice. When you see it, you go, oh, okay, I didn't know you could do that. Hopefully, anyway. So the probability that y equals to 3, that's easy. Because it's a Poisson, it's going to be n, which is 4, choose 3. And then probability of success, which is 0.19 to the power of the amount of successes, which is 3, times by 1 minus this, which is not going to be 0 0 0 it's going to be 0.81, I believe, to the power of failures. And now if I do that, I don't need my calculator function, for, well, I don't need my statistics function for that. So option, I have 4, choose 3, times by 0.19 to the power of 3, times by 0.81 to the power of 1, we should get 0.022236 and stuff, but I'll just leave that as 0.22. Okay, so find the probability that in exactly three of these periods there was no cause. Well, there's only a, roughly a 2.2% chance that in three of those periods she's going to have no calls. Make of that what you will. Part C. On another occasion, Indre took one break of five minutes and one break of 15 minutes. Find the probability that Indre missed exactly one call in each of these two breaks. Okay, so in the five minute interval, that behaved exactly like our Z distribution, um, where Z was distributed Poissonly by five thirds. But now in the 15 minute interval, it's three times as big. So actually, let's call this Z2. This is going to be distributed by a Poisson distribution of five now, because we've got to scale it up by three. So I want to know the probability that z equals to 1 under this distribution. So if I go over to my distributions, Poisson, PD function, I want 1 as my x value, 5 thirds, I get that value is 0 0.31479, which I'm just going to round to 0 point, like I'm just going to leave it as 0 0.3148. I mean, it does go on, but I'm just going to leave it as that. And now I'm going to do the similar thing, but for this one. So the probability that z2 equals 1 is going to be when I change this to a 5, that is going to be 0 0.0338, uh, which I'll leave as 0 0.337. Now, because it's reasonable to assume that the 5 minute break is independent of the 15 minute break in terms of calls made. If I want to find the probability that there was one call in the first and one call in the second, all I need to do now is just multiply these two events together because they're probabilistically independent. So I just menu 1 and then I'll do 0 0.3148 times by 0 0.0337. And I'm looking at 0 0.0106 to four decimal places, but to three decimal places, Let's call it 0.011. So there is about a 1.1% chance that in both breaks, whether it's 5 minutes or 15 minutes, that she's going to miss a call, a one call from both breaks. You tell me. But there you go. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Right, we've got a couple more. This was actually taken, this question was taken from last year's further stats paper. And the reason why it just starts at part C is because part A and B, uh, although you can kind of do just yet, it was building up to the chi-squared distribution uh, for goodness of fit. And that's we're going to do that not next week, the week after. So uh, that will be done, probability and statistics, chapter 10. Um, so yeah, don't panic about it. I've just isolated the bit that you only need to work on now. And I guarantee this is a Poisson distribution. So if you want to pause the video and give it a go yourself. Okay, 
Liam and Simone are studying the distribution of oak trees in some woodland. They divide the woodland into 80 equal squares and recorded the number of oak trees in each square. The results are summarised in the table one below. There you go. Simone believes that a Poisson distribution could be used to model the number of oak trees per square. She calculates the expected frequency given in table 3. Find the value of S and find the value of T and give your answers to two decimal places. Now the problem with this is we think Simone is distributing this by a Poisson distribution with some lambda, but we have no idea what that lambda is. But fortunately, we've got enough information from this table. Now, this 0 or 1 stuff isn't particularly useful. Uh, we'll see why in a second, and neither is this 6 or more. But the fact we've got these two values is, means we've got enough information. Because now, remember, if I want the probability that x equals to 2, right, from the table, that's 16.07 out of the total 80 trees, right? If that's the expected free, expected probability. But from a Poisson distribution, it's going to be lambda to the squared power times by e to the negative lambda all over 2 factorial, which is 2. And then I can pull the same trick for when x equals to 4. Well, this is going to be 14.58 over 80 from the expected, from what um, Simone believes. And this is lambda to the power of 4 times by e to the minus lambda, all over 4 factorial, which I believe is 24. And now we've got two equations, one unknown, so this is actually really easy to solve for now. Um, we could have just solved it from the top one, but generally speaking, polynomials and exponentials are quite hard to separate. But now we've got this information, we can actually do something quite nice. If I call the bottom one equation 2 and the top one equation 1, look what happens if I do equation 2 divided by equation 1. I get 14.58 over 80, all divided by... 16.07 divided by 80, and this equals lambda to the 4, e to the minus lambda, over 24, all divided by lambda squared, e to the minus lambda, all over 2. Now look what happens. This is great. We can cancel the e to the minus lambdas. We can times by 2 top and bottom, so this 24 becomes a 12, and that 2 disappears. And then the lambda squared we can get rid of, and this becomes a lambda squared on the top. So really, on the right-hand side, we've got lambda squared over 12. On the left-hand side, we can just times by 80 top and bottom, so we've got 14.58 equals 16.07. And now this is incredibly easy to work out what lambda is, because all we need to do is the square root of 12 times by 14.58 all over 16.07 and this is lambda I know technically you've got the plus or minus from the square rooting process but we're going to take the positive square root because it doesn't make sense to have a rate that's negative well I suppose it's negative decay but in the context of the question it doesn't make sense for trees to survive in an oakland and you look back and there's negative trees that doesn't make sense um, are they zombie trees what's going on uh, fine, so let's shift square root fraction 12 times by 14.58 all over 16.07. So lambda appears to be 3.2996 and so on, but I'm going to take that as 3.30 to two decimal places. So you're probably thinking, okay, you've worked out lambda, and now we've actually got a use that lambda to work out what it is for 3 and 5. Bearing in mind this is the expected frequency. So what is the probability that x equals 3, say? Well, that's going to be, if I use my calculator, it's going to be distribution not normal, back it up, uh, Poisson, distribution on x to be 3, my lambda to be 3.30. That apparently is 0 0.22 
1173 and to get the expected frequency I just times it by 80 and then while I'm in stats mode I might as well do this for 5 uh, so I want my x value to be 5 now lambda to be 3.30 and this is going to be 0 0.12028643 and to get the expected frequency I times by 80 okay so back it up I've got 0 0.2209173 times 80 so I've now got 17.67 to two decimal places and that is S and then 0 0.12028643 times by 80, I will get 9.62 to two decimal places, and this will be my T value. Coolsies. So yeah, not that bad. A nice little problem, just you know, testing your idea of do you understand the price on distribution, can you calculate distributions, that kind of thing. The question then went on to um, doing hypothesis tests with chi-squared, that kind of thing. And maybe we'll have a look at it at a later date, probably in the next two weeks. Anyway, final question. So if you want to pause the video and give it a go yourself. Okay, breakdowns occur on a particular machine at a random mean rate of 1.25 a week. Find the probability that fewer than three breakdowns occurred in a randomly chosen week. So the intervals are the same, so let x be Poisson distributed with a rate of five quarters, because 1.25 is five quarters, right? So I want to find the probability that x is fewer than three. This is the same as the probability that x is less than or equal to two. So pretty easily I'm just going to let x equals to 2 and lambda equals to 5 quarters or 1.25 into my Poisson um, PD function and this should just spit out the answer of uh, douche, 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 douche. so x is 2 lambda is 1.25 should give 0 0.2238 to four decimal places. Uh, it keeps on going 0 0.22383187, but I'll leave it as that, that's fine. Part B. Over a four week period, okay, the machine was monitored. During this time, there were 11 breakdowns. Tests at the 5% level of significance whether or not there is evidence the rate of breakdowns has changed over this period. Right. So H0 will be that the rate has not changed. And think about it, for one week, if it was 1.25, you've got to times it by 4, you've got to scale it up. So that means the average rate should be 5 a week. And the alternate hypothesis is there is a change in that 5. So there's my hypothesis. Now, that means that if I was to draw the boxes for this distribution... And this is very, very bad, and it goes on forever, then because the significance level alpha is 5%, I want to find the box where this is 2.5% and the upper bit where this region is 2.5%. Now, it doesn't actually ask me to find the critical region. In actual fact, I just have to make a decision on where this 11 breakdowns reside. So, what I should do is I should consider the probability that x is greater than or equal to 11. Well, that's the same as 1 minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 10. So, that's 1 minus, and if I use my calculator, then my lower bound is 0, my upper bound is 10, uh, or just use x if you've got the fx991ex and lambda is 5 in this case then you should get 0 0.98630473 and if I do 1 minus that I get the probability that x is greater than or equal to 11 as 
0.0136952727 and so on, which is 0.014 to three decimal places. Now think about it. That means greater than or equal to 11 means that I've drawn a line here such that this is where the 11 bar is and then it goes 12 and then it goes 13 and so on such that this area to infinity is 1.4%. That's what 0.014 means. That's clearly to the right of this 2.5%, which means we're clearly in the H1 region. The other H1 region is back here, and the H0 acceptance region is over here. So clearly, because 0.014 is less than 0.025, we will reject H0, and therefore there is evidence at the 5% level that lambda has changed from 5. So we can be 95% sure that the rate is not the same anymore. Or another way of putting it is if the rate was 5 a week, be getting 11 breakdowns a week would be in the top 1.4% and that's too freaky and it fails this test at the 5% level. Therefore this could be used as part of evidence to suggest that the mean is no longer 5. Okay, well I hope you enjoyed that um, and yeah that's pretty much the Poisson distribution in a nutshell. Have fun.